Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Startup Innovation Forum 2022. On behalf of the National Additive Manufacturing Innovation Cluster, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us on this Friday afternoon as we bring back the third edition of the largest additive manufacturing startup pitching event in the Asia-Pacific region. Today, we are honoured to be joined by our guests of honours from Enterprise Singapore and SG Innovate. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Assistant CEO for Innovation and Enterprise at Enterprise Singapore, Mr. Edwin Chow, and Chief Executive of SG Innovate, Dr. Lim Jay. Well, uh, I don't know if Ju is joining us uh, virtually or you know with a telegraph on those uh, hologram presents, but unfortunately, you just have to settle for me for a start. Um, uh, well, it. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Chao Singh and friends at uh, NAMIC. Uh, it's uh, indeed a pleasure to be here uh, for the third edition of the uh, Innovation Startup Forum. And, and, and for the first time in two years, it's so great to be able to see people's faces uh, in such a hall. And then along may that continue. Now, um, as uh, most of you know, Enterprise Singapore is uh, uh, involved in, uh, together with our other sister agencies in uh, EDB, ASTAR, and NRF, uh, we are, our mission and mandate is to help uh, Singapore-based startups and SMEs to grow, both here as well as overseas, uh, and uh, with a particular focus for us on deep tech. Uh, and uh, I recall, uh, you know, back in 2014, 2015, when uh, we first uh, thought about uh, setting up uh, uh, the innovation cluster that is now NAMIC, right? uh, additive manufacturing was just coming out from the labs uh, into industry parlance, uh, there was a lot of giddy optimism that you know within 10 years everyone will have a 3D printer at home and machine tool companies would all be uh, obsolete. Uh, but I, I guess it's fair to say that hasn't quite come to pass, at least not yet. But I think over the past uh, seven, eight years, uh, and in, 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 with a lot of uh, good work done by NAMIC, I think industry in Singapore and regionally uh, have become more accustomed to the use of additive manufacturing. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I read a report uh, recently, uh, the total number of 3D printers, right, both metal as well as uh, polymer, uh, the total number of 3D printers sold in 2019 was 1.4 million. 2021, it jumped up to 2.2 million. 50% increase in two to three years. Take that with a pinch of salt, but still, that shows a pretty interesting uptrend. And you know, back home, uh, through, again, through the good work of NAMIC, we find that uh, our homegrown startups, uh, companies like 3D Metal Forge, uh, Structo, uh, the uh, aligner, uh, uh, 3D printers of dental aligners, uh, even uh, uh, Forefront uh, Additive Manufacturing, they are all uh, gaining traction. Uh, 3D Metal Forge, uh, as you know, they listed in Australia, but they recently secured a contract to uh, offer 3D printing services in Twasport. PSA's uh, uh, centerpiece. Uh, likewise, uh, Structo has uh, grown, its, spread its wings uh, globally. Uh, revenue now, I think, north of uh, uh, tens of millions of dollars. So there is optimism, right? Even some of our thermostic link companies are now getting into the act, right? uh, investing in uh, uh, wire-based additive manufacturing spin-off. Unfortunately, not from uh, local universities, but from the UK. Uh, but still, it shows that there is optimism. So does it mean that we are, we are, we are there, that you know, we are on a good uh, path to success? Uh, not quite yet, unfortunately. Uh, we were looking at some uh, statistics on the number of deep tech, uh, early stage investments in Singapore. Um, quite sobering, quite sobering. 2019, uh, there were about $110, $120 million worth of early stage deep tech deals. And deep tech here includes the four domains that I'm sure most of you know. Eh? Uh, 2020 right, went up to about 340 million, not bad, 3x. Last year, almost 900 million, and this was despite COVID. Unfortunately, when you break it down, 80% of these deals were from the pharmaceuticals, medtech, as well as AI machine learning space. Manufacturing technologies only accounted for less than 20%. Right? So 
we still have quite a fair amount of work to do, and that's why uh, events and, uh, like this uh, are so important, because it allows teams, startup teams with good ideas, good technology, to meet investors, to get profiled to other investors outside Singapore, and hopefully to then uh, draw in uh, the money and the resources that's needed for these startups to grow. Uh, and we are very uh, pleased uh, to, to, to partner with uh, NAMIC uh, as part, as you know, uh, this is the event, the winner of this event will be fast-tracked into our Slingshot Global Startup Competition. Uh, and of course, I have to give a plug to Slingshot and switch. Uh, please, if you haven't already done so, book your diaries, 25th to 28th October here at, uh, no, sorry, not Marina Bay Sands, but Resorts World Sentosa, unfortunately. Um, at, uh, uh, as part of the event, uh, Slingshot, our uh, global competition, um, this year we've attracted close to 4,000 uh, applicants from 130 countries. We're in the process of whittling it down to the top 250. Uh, and uh, I was told this year we are seeing, we're going to see a, a large number of uh, startups coming from uh, countries like Korea, Japan, even China, uh, COVID lockdown notwithstanding. And surprisingly for me at least, uh, a good number from uh, Brazil, from Latin America. So I think this, this uh, shows that there is global interest in Singapore and the Southeast Asian region. Uh, and I would encourage all of you to uh, mark your diaries and go down and meet some of these interesting uh, startup teams from all around the world. Okay, with that, let me conclude once again by uh, thanking uh, Chao Singh and congratulating him and the NAMIC team for pulling off this event. And I'm really looking forward to hearing the startup pitches later. Thank you very much. Thank you, Edwin. And now for the first event on our agenda today, we'll be having our fireside chat where we will dig deep into the topic, is there light at the end of the tunnel for deep tech startup? And joining us in our fireside chat today, we have Phil Inagaki, Managing Director of Zora Innovation, Cyril Ebersweller, Founder of Hex, John Sharp, Managing Partner of Hatcher, and last but not least, Mr. Edwin Chow, our Guest of Honor from Enterprise Singapore. And moderating our discussion today, we have Chaw Singh, Chief Executive Officer at NAMIC. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for our panellists and moderator. We'll get lost there, right? Exactly. Yep. Thank you very much, uh, Lorene, and a uh, very warm welcome to all of you again. Uh, first and foremost, thank you to, uh, and I wanted to, before I start this uh, session, I wanted to just give a quick introduction um, of our, all our distinguished panelists uh, who represent some of the leading uh, venture capital from both the private and public and the deep tech startup space in Singapore. First, uh, John Sharp, uh, he's actually the founding partner of Hatcher Plus, uh, which is a Singapore-based uh, vast technology platform venture as a service. Um, they use uh, AI pr process automation and global deal origination network to enable investors to make uh, informed decisions on opportunities. He also recently started a Carbon Nation Blue Fund that looks into restoration of farm land and mangroves to improve carbon sequestration. Mm. Welcome, John. Uh, next, of course, we have Atwin, as, a, as he's already introduced himself. Uh, so he has been involved with us uh, since uh, the inception of uh, the, NAMIC since uh, seven years ago, and he used to chair our oversight steering committee. We have Phil Inagaki, he's uh, Zora Innovations Managing Director. Uh, it's a Tomasic led VC fund focused on science and deep tech early ventures and startups. He was previously from the engine, uh, a mighty venture builder capital spin off created to support deep tech startups that seek to create a positive impact in society. Uh, last but not least, we have uh, Cyril, he's the general partner at SOSV. Uh, $300 million fund and founder of Hacks, uh, an early stage incubator, hot tech accelerator and venture platform. So Hacks is uh, one of the few uh, hardware accelerator that we know uh, that provides hands-on support and investment as part of the SOC SV portfolio. And has been based in Singapore for the last one year and very fortunate to have him here with us. So uh, we'll just get started. Uh, we all know the markets uh, have been rocked uh, topsy-turvy since the start of the year. Uh, with the war effects from pandemic, fl inflation, increased interest rates, uh, even bifurcation due to geopolitical tensions. Um, 
The venture and private equity markets are now more deliberate and temporary expectations on startups with uh, sky-high valuations, and in, in some cases even keeping their dry powder for uh, rainy days. So what used to be considered uh, you know, attractive, which is startups with exponential growth potential, uh, but unprofitable, uh, you know, kind of like now receiving a reality check. Uh, the startups in the hot tech and deep tech space are affected, of course, just as much. And even high growth companies in the public markets are not spared, as we recently saw uh, with C. So let me just start uh, with the first question uh, for all of you, and we can go through uh, the round. Uh, what, what is your current assessment of you know, the current global situation? And how do you think this is uh, affecting uh, the VC global markets, uh, like in the US, China, and of, of course in Singapore? Maybe we can start with you, John. I knew I'd be in the hot seat and you know, <laughs> sat down here. Um, look, I, I think um, my own personal perspective, we just uh, closed. So we're a VC, but we're also a startup. Uh, we develop technology to help other VCs make decisions and handle process flow. Uh, so we just raised a close to Series A in July for $12 million. We didn't lose one cent on valuation. Um, and part of the reason for that is because we, didn't, we don't believe that there's a correlation between public markets and venture valuations. If you have anyone that's got a startup in the audience here, is, you're going to list 10, 12 years from now. Um, I don't see a correlation between what's happening here between overpriced Zoom and Netflix stock and Facebook stock. What, what else did we do during the pandemic? They're the three activities that we basically did at home. So it's not a surprise, I think, for any of us that the public markets have come down based on a handful of, uh, of technology stocks. Um, so I don't think that anyone in this room should take to heart any correlation between the public markets and, uh, and venture valuations. It's a great time to be a VC. We're still a VC, even though we're a tech developer. Um, so if someone wants to give us a lower valuation based on their assumed um, write down of their own valuation, of course, we're going to take that in any VC would. We're, we're commercial folks. Um, but my own personal view is that this is a non-correlated event and that venture should be excluded from concerns about what's going on way upstairs and way downstream of where we typically play. Well, thanks. Um, my, I, I echo uh, John's uh, uh, views. I, I think that uh, if we start with the public markets uh, downturn, the impact uh, has been felt and will continue to be felt by companies that are maybe in the later stages. So uh, your, your sort of pre-IPO uh, late stage uh, tech startup, uh, whose uh, business model previously was uh, spend as much money as you can to acquire so-called eyeballs and don't worry about profitability, I think those companies uh, will find it more difficult to exit, um, and, as, and that could have then a, a knock-on effect to uh, uh, people's uh, uh, investment appetite uh, at those stages. But um, for companies in the very early stage, uh, I don't think that has uh, uh, quite uh, affected uh, them yet. Uh, in fact, it may turn out to be a bonus, because now you're going to have a lot of uh, people being let go from uh, big tech. Uh, that uh, you know, uh, uh, seed and A round uh, funded uh, startups can go out and hire. Um, the, th the the one thing that that, uh, that that does offer a little bit of concern to me actually is is uh, this uh, sort of global inflation, uh, the impacts on supply chains, and how that will affect uh, spending patterns and therefore investment decisions by by large corporates around the world. Um, jury is still out, I think, and it's my own personal uh, opinion. Um, but uh, this is definitely something we should be watchful for, uh, especially um, what's going to happen in China um, next year. Uh, I mean, you read in the press, uh, the uh, property market there, which drives a lot of uh, their, their investment, uh, is, uh, is going through a bumpy ride. And if uh, China uh, doesn't grow as much as it you know, used to, if uh, the US and Europe are caught because of um, high energy prices and the knock-on inflation effects, then uh, next year uh, we have to be prepared for some uh, turbulence. Right? But again, early stage, especially early stage uh, AM uh, startups, probably still insulated. Yeah, I would, um, well, I think it's a great point that talent is more available and this is a big advantage right now. I would echo the point that the earlier stage you are, the least affected you are, but um, while we're a VC fund and we're co-investing with other VC funds all the time, 
we've definitely seen valuations be tighter, diligence be tighter. So it, you have to go in understanding, you know, in some ways the bar is higher. But what I'll say is from, you know, a big long-term perspective, I still think it's an incredibly exciting time. I was a startup founder um, or hired CEO from 2002 to 2017 before switching over to venture. All deep tech, all physical sciences. And there was not a lot of money, right? I call 2000 to 2015 kind of the deep tech, physical sciences, venture funding winter. And um, you know, starting around 2016, there was a resurgence. We see it, I mean, we saw it in additive manufacturing, we see it in semiconductors, we certainly see it in climate tech. And um, I think one of the reasons it's really exciting to be early stage right now is there is a lot of later stage money which has come into play, right? People have raised very large funds. And as we come out of you know, this period of uncertainty, um, all that money is going to look for high quality startups which are maturing from early stage to mid stage to later stage. So, um, you know, we see it as a tougher fundraising uh, environment. I, I'll give a little moderate view there, but I still believe fundamentally, if you are a little careful about it, this is a fantastic time to be starting a company, a deep tech company. Yeah, it's, it's quite uh, you know uh, the, the topic, right? Um, uh, and um, uh, I th I think from um, overall the, the the word that I um, have in mind when it comes down to uh, what came down over the last uh, two three years is uh, is uh, vulnerability essentially. So most countries have been and companies have been exposed uh, to vulnerab vulnerability. Sorry vulnerabilities, it's not easy to say. Um, uh, and um, uh, essentially, you know, the, the, the world has changed quite a bit uh, to, uh, I think, uh, most of our uh, surprise um, in, in many ways since uh, uh, we're probably, uh, you know, born into uh, uh, globalization um, and uh, we live in Singapore, uh, which is, you know, sort of the epitome of uh, what globalization is about. Um, and um, so it's quite a you know a shocker uh, to see uh, uh, you know companies essentially deglobalizing and uh, having to fend off uh, for you know food security, um, you know energy of course uh, and, and industry security. Um, and so we've definitely entered a new phase here, uh, which uh, is important for everybody to understand. Um, uh, I call that f future proofing essentially, um, and. Um, What's interesting about it is that it's, it's going to create new sets of opportunities that uh, weren't here before, um, in particular um, uh, when it comes to deep tech companies and, and climate tech, for example, um, because you will have like three sets of innovation that are uh, you know, happening. Uh, one that is uh, essentially global from day one, like uh, you know, electric vehicles, for example, that everybody can use. Um, uh, and then you have you know, technologies that needs to be pushed by uh, governments to reach economies of scale, for example. Um, but the last layer is actually the most interesting, um, I think, because it's more of the uh, emerging market uh, equation, uh, which uh, uh, you know we are uh, all in, I guess, in Southeast Asia and, uh, to, to some extent, um, which can uh, sort of do what, what happened to uh, uh, with the mobile uh, you know waves uh, that uh, went beyond the PCs uh, in most countries around the world, and so you have technologies that can be built from the ground up, essentially, and immediately adopted. Uh, by many, many countries that aren't, you know, U.S. or, or, or European countries. Um, uh, so, so that's why I'm quite bullish from a, a startup perspective uh, here. Uh, and, you know, I, I tend to agree about everything that has been said about early stage and late stage. And the only thing that really affects the, uh, the, the, the stock market, uh, the, the people affected are actually the VCs themselves uh, receiving less money. Uh, but at the same time, there are still $300 billion in the U.S. Uh, available for everybody. So, you know, uh, there is uh, plenty of money uh, in the system. And, and it's just uh, people, uh, you know, were uh, you know, fed up, I guess, with uh, COVID quarantines. And, you know, summer came up and everything slowed down very meaningfully for, you know, uh, everybody, I think. Uh, but uh, uh, we should get back to, you know, uh, work pretty soon uh, overall with the uh, industry. And uh, so, again, lots of uh, opportunities to start a company now. Yeah, I think the, there's no doubt that the, um, with this turbulence, right, the markets that uh, you have, and um, I'm just wondering, you know, the fact that, uh, you know, public markets are pulling back, you know, do you see this actually uh, benefiting the, the private markets? 
in the in the venture cap world, for example, that people are perhaps uh, you know riding on some of the points that you all made about opportunities and the need for technology, right, to solve some of the hardest problems on the planet. But is are the are, do you observe this uh, sort of uh, focus, right, of uh, you know more funds moving in in that direction or? Uh, it's difficult time still because, uh, as you know, the, uh, there hasn't been any IPO this year. Uh, the MNA has crashed by half uh, because companies cannot use their public currency anymore to acquire mm -hmm. smaller companies, which is what makes work the VC model, essentially. You need that liquidity. Right. Um, uh, so it's not a good news, temporarily speaking, until things you know, sort of um, uh, come back to normal here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, another factor is... Um, you know, again, on a long term, it's different, but depending on the stage of the company, for example, we look a lot at climate tech. If you're starting to be at the stage where we're looking at real projects and you need project financing, well, interest rates matter a lot, right? You, you see in the business model it come down, you see the profitability, the cost, and already in a lot of cases, you know, you're facing the good old green premium, right? Mm -hmm. Higher interest rates, usually that green premium increases. These projects are more risky. It's not like a proven photovoltaic technology. So mm -hmm. th there is real impact. I don't, you know, I wouldn't, there is real impact, but still very optimistic. Right. <laughs> yeah, maybe let me build on Phil's point. The, uh, I think it's, it's not just uh, the differentiated by sectors, mm -hmm. but I think we also need to look at the differences across geographies and regions. And the markets, some markets are, uh, have uh, certain unique characteristics which uh, insulate them a little bit more from whether it's rising interest rates or, or, or inflation. Uh, I mean, you know, since uh, travel resume, I've been doing a bit of a revenge uh, business travel myself. So I've uh, been to the US, uh, Europe, Israel, uh, Indonesia, and recently India. And in, the thing that struck me was when I asked the same questions to people I met across these five geographies, the answers that came back were, were different. Right? So for example, in, in Indonesia, uh, when I asked a bunch of uh, VCs and, and family officers, right, are they affected, the kind of questions that Chao Seng asked us, to them, it's, it's an alien uh, concept. It's like, yes, yeah, it's going on, but it's affecting someone else. <laughs> For me here, all I'm worried about is how I'm going to scale my startup from Jakarta out to Surabaya, to Bandung, to all the tier two, tier three uh, cities. Right? And they are, they are really uh, pushing their guys to go out. Mm. Similarly, when I was in India, um, the, the people we met were, were, were more cautious. Yes, they were more cautious. Uh, but to them, uh, they were still extremely optimistic, just purely based on demographics and the talent pool that's coming out from their, their, their uh, colleges. Um, they are still very bullish that India would grow domestically 4 or 5%, partly driven by uh, Mr. Modi's decision to seriously de-link uh, from China. So when I last went to India pre-COVID, you could see uh, Chinese billboards everywhere you know, advertising Oppo and Xiaomi and so on. But this time around, nothing. Right. And the Indian government has uh, uh, publicly backed uh, uh, one of their conglomerates to start a wafer fab in Gujarat, exploring a second one in, in uh, Bangalore. Uh, they're also pushing this uh, Made in India concept, uh, where local content now is, uh, is uh, required. And I think if our companies here uh, have, are willing to sort of uh, explore these markets as markets themselves and not be too worried about the global trend, I think there's still a lot of money to be made there. It's interesting what you're saying about uh, family offices, Edwin, because we, we're doing a lot of work with UBS at the moment. They published a report in, in June, um, a family office report. So it's very recent data. They did these surveys in, um, <clears throat> in the first half of the year. There's a ton of money out there. It's basically changing targets. Um, so people that were putting a stack of money, family offices that were investing um, a lot in public markets, suddenly that's, you know, that's, that's not the flavour of the month anymore. Um, a lot of families are now moving that capital towards venture capital, and so suddenly we as VCs face competition uh, from family offices. And what I see a lot at the conferences that I, that I go to, and I try to go to one a month, is increasingly the family offices are coming in as real competitors to us. They're, they're, they're staffing up, they're getting a front office and back office together. We're putting technology in place to help them do that, which is why we interface with these family offices and why we know what's going on. Um, if you combine that with you know, the fact that you've got JP Morgan lending $4 billion to Tiger Global and people that weren't previously on the scene, you could actually paint a picture where there's a lot more capital coming into venture capital than there was, say, five years ago, because it's coming from 
all these disparate sources. What, I'll end on one point, and that is that 10 years ago, family offices were responsible for about 1.3% of deals, and last year they were responsible for close to 10. Wow. Um, so that's a massive increase in spending from family offices, and it's looking a, a tad exponential. You know, I think we can, we can be firmly of the view that family offices will play a pretty significant role in funding companies going forward. That said, they may not have quite the risk appetite of a Hatcher or an Enterprise Singapore or an SOSV or other people that invest early stage, but they're certainly going to be on the scene. They're certainly going to be sources of capital. Just, just writing on that, what, do, what about the corporate VCs? I mean, do you see them? I think if anyone's point? pulled back, it's probably those guys, right? I mean, a, a good friend of mine who runs a corporate VC in, in um, I won't be too specific, in Australia, uh, said to me something I thought was quite wise once. He said, corporate VCs generally flourish until there's a change of CEO. <laughs> and then they, then they go, wait, what's this on, down here on the p &L? Let's get rid of those guys. And, uh, and I've seen that happen a few times, actually. We have a few corporates in our fund. And, 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 and when it hits the wall, it hits, it hits pretty hard. Yeah. Yeah, it's every, every five years, yeah, the same story all over again. So it's not the first time um, that, uh, that we see that. But um, this time, it might be felt a bit more because, uh, I don't know, I've, I've seen crazy statistics uh, over the last couple of years where CVCs were 50% of uh, the funding in VC. Yeah. Um, and, and it's only direct funding, but... CVCs are also, uh, as we all know, funding VCs themselves. Um, and uh, some VCs are actually only CVCs behind. Uh, most people don't know that uh, uh, for, for the most part. Uh, so, so that might be felt a bit more um, uh, in that regard. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I think, um, yes, and we've seen this as well. They, they may have addressed it even more because they'll react as a corporation. But um, again, in deep tech, um, I think CVCs are a really important part of the ecosystem. I mean, we basically invest at Zora and ultimately businesses that are B2B, right? And, you know, when you're piloting technologies, bringing them to the market, it's always through partnerships. Um, CVCs also, some of the, I mean, CVCs also, there's a lot of different funds, right? There's some which have been steady over a long time and are managing billions of dollars, and there's some which are experiments, and yes, change of CEO, and then everything changes. Yeah. But one of the really useful uh, places is when the rounds get larger, right? When you, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of our startups are going to get into those rounds, which are 100 million, 200 million, yeah. 300 yeah. million. There was, you know, the one of the great examples is the engine, my old friend. They wrote the first half million check in a company called Commonwealth Fusion Systems. <laughs> Um, five years later, they raised 1.8 billion in a single round, right? A lot of money needs to go into these companies, and um, the right CVCs can have deep pockets and be mm -hmm. very important players in the ecosystem, I think. So if I pull back from the, uh, from the investor vantage point to the um, companies, right, the startups, um, you know, without the typical scalability like those in uh, internet-based startups, you know, how can you know, this sort of hard tech companies uh, better position, right? Because uh, you guys look at a lot of these companies. How, do you, how would you advise uh, these uh, startup founders to, you know, to be able to become more investable? Beyond the fact that, of course, they have good technology, right? That's a given. We're not hardware um, specialists. We're not additive manufacturing specialists at all. We, we partner with accelerators around the world, and that's where we get our, our deal flow. Um, from. We're actually talking with, with you guys at the moment, I think, about doing some stuff uh, with hacks because we don't have enough hardware um, deals coming into us at the moment. But I think the difficulty there is it is a smaller ecosystem by and large. Mm -hmm. um, it's enormously, I'm a software developer, it's enormously easy to write software that can look incredibly impressive very quickly. Um, so, so funding that is, is, I think, quite a bit easier than a lot of what you guys are, are working on, which is, is, is tremendously difficult in, in many aspects. Um, so I think it's a, I'd say it's a, it's a smaller ecosystem, but I would say that said, the kind of people that you're going to meet in that ecosystem are going to be probably more expert and more dedicated to what you're doing than, than the general run-of-the-mill mm -hmm. you know, GP partner. Yeah. No, I, I would agree, and, and to, to, to add on to that point, if we think, at least from, from the companies that we have invested in and we have supported, right, the ones who, uh, the early stage guys who really make it are those that, uh, have some early product market fit, quick product, product market fit, 
usually in the B2B space, uh, to add on to Phil's point, uh, working with a corporate uh, to basically prove that their solution can solve a problem that a company is prepared to pay to solve. Right? It's very simple logic. And um, that's one of the reasons why we at Enterprise Singapore have been quite big on, on what we call open innovation challenges. But basically, it's a, it's, a, it's a way to get our tech startups, deep tech startups, in front of corporates uh, to show them that the, uh, the solutions developed here uh, can actually help them increase the corporate's bottom line, top line, etc. And we've seen some early successes. Right? And uh, there's a drone company uh, called Performance Rotos, uh, not, 3D print, uh, not 3D printing, sorry. Uh, but uh, they uh, were able to uh, inspect the big pipes in some of uh, Jurong Island's petrochemical complexes right, quickly. And because of that, they were able to reduce the downtime for these uh, big petrochemical giants. And you know, for them, every day that you're down is you know, the dollar that's burned. And uh, their technology impressed uh, the plant manager so much that he, he sort of fought for them to be put in front of their global VP. Uh, and uh, since then, the, 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 the company is uh, now running pilots uh, in, in Thailand, in the US. And I think this will help them scale up uh, even more quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, so if we can collectively in the ecosystem here, because we are so small, but if we can work, put our brains together and and systematically tap the you know, thousands of multinationals and large local companies that are here, get them to be our uh, pilot customer for deep tech startups. I think that'll make a big difference. I mean, the work that you do, uh, I mean, as, as one of the key uh, agencies looking at the startup ecosystem, do you think uh, Singapore companies are doing enough, right, to leverage on um, this sort of regional uh, yeah. neighbors and markets? I mean. Yeah. Short answer is no. I think we can do a lot more. Um, we are, we're trying to help, right? So from Enterprise Singapore's point of view, we have these global innovation alliances where we, where we identify uh, accelerators, uh, VCs, even corporates uh, in key markets and uh, get them to help prepare and pull our startups uh, into the, those markets earlier on to get them to access customers, investors, and especially talent. And, and to me, I think that's one area where uh, our founders uh, here uh, need to, uh, there's, there's a missed opportunity. Mm. Right? So uh, as I was saying just now, I was, I've been doing quite a bit of traveling uh, recently, uh, and two, two sort of uh, uh, incidents uh, really uh, spring to mind. Um, one was in uh, Indonesia. So I met this uh, young startup from the, the ITB, the Institute Technology Bandung, that's Indonesia's equivalent of MIT. Right? And uh, this team, uh, their technology was uh, mycelium. So they found a way to harvest mycelium from fung fungi. Uh, and then they tapped an IP that was created not in, in Bandung, but in Singapore, NUS Create, right? Uh, which allowed them to shape and their, their mycelium substrate into something that looked like leather. Uh, somehow they got in touch with someone from uh, Louis Vuitton the, 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 the designers like the idea because it is, it is, it is vegan leather. They marketed it as vegan leather. Uh, some model did a runway show in, uh, in Paris. Lo and behold, these guys got an order for $5 million worth of leather. Now they're scrambling to raise money. Right? And the best part for, for Enterprise Singapore for me was when I started to tell them about you know, our programs here, maybe they should do something here. We mentioned the Zora and all that. They say, yeah, 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 we know, we know. In Bantong, because of our friends in NUS, we know you have these innovation challenges, these programs. So it was like the Indonesian founders knew more about the programs here in Singapore than I think some of our deep tech founders do. Right? And then when I asked him, do you have other friends in your cohort that does this sort of thing? He's a biotech engineer. His co-founder is an architect. He says, yes, they all want to do this, but because Gojek and Tokopedia are paying them $5,000 a month, they all end up being developers there. But I think if our deep tech founders here are prepared to go up to Bandung right, and just do a roadshow there, you may be able to find a lot of technical talent to bring back to Singapore. Mm -hmm. right, so I think this is one, one opportunity that I, I, would, I would urge the, the deep tech founders here to, to tap on the programs. And we, we have Enterprise Singapore has these things all set up already. Right? Mm -hmm. Take advantage of the opportunity now. If you raise enough money, grab the regional talent at play. And that will then help you to speed your growth. I was actually unaware of how many people you actually have overseas. We we did a trip to Saudi mm. and 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 UAE a year or so ago, and and the guys, the Enterprise Singapore guys, were awesome. They they made all these introductions, came to the meetings, are uh, terrific. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. so definitely would encourage founders to take advantage of that because it's it's a great resource. 
So I know, I know, Saril, you're you've been um, running hacks for for quite a while, right? So I just wanted to maybe uh, you can share with the audience here about uh, this uh, concept of hardware accelerator. Right? Is that is that working well in general for for you, or is it? It's okay. It's okay. Uh, <laughs> so yeah. So uh, I started uh, back in 2012, uh, and um, actually the original idea was uh, uh, I, I was uh, the first investor in a company called Form Labs that uh, most of you probably uh, mm. know of, and uh, um, uh, another also famous but uh, that died unfortunately called Leap Motion, uh, which was doing a hand recognition uh, device. Um, and um, I was in China at the time, and so I was like, okay, how can I help them, essentially? And my background wasn't at all um, in, in the hardware space, but um, uh, visiting uh, Shenzhen at that time uh, was quite interesting because of, uh, uh, it was really the beginning of, uh, not the beginning, a good, good chunk of it, of the, the Shanghai movement, uh, you know, the incremental innovation, essentially. Uh, uh, and so they had things like... Uh, the mobile phone with a razor, you know, <laughs> that sort of thing. Um, and but what was cool about it was was uh, was the fact that you could buy this essentially, and uh, it cost it two hundred bucks. And um, uh, so it got my head scratching about oh, actually, it's a great place for startups to come in and uh, learn uh, essentially from uh, people that do make things uh, at all time. Um, and um, uh, and so uh, so we did that with you know essentially ninety percent of the companies were uh, foreigners coming from all over the world. Uh, in the US in particular for uh, the last 10 years, uh, hundreds of companies uh, that went uh, through uh, uh, the program over there. Um, and we had um, essentially, uh, we started with just, uh, you know, like 50 square meters and we ended up with 5,000 square meters uh, in the heart of Shenzhen with a mm -hmm. workshop, a bio lab, um, and uh, about 200 people essentially that uh, was, were there as a, the accelerator program, but also the incubation that happens, you know, uh, throughout time. Right. Um, and um, so, does that work? Yes, I, I, I think so. Uh, the, the idea was really to reduce the time to market, um, because essentially we are the first check. Uh, so it was quite selfish, uh, you know, in, in some ways. Yeah. It was, you know, can we reduce the money that they are spending uh, in, in order to get to a prototype that is, you know, viable for the market, and then, you know, uh, raise money because we need uh, also a village to, to do that uh, with us. Um, and um, over time, I think one of the uh, the things I retained was that. Things are getting a lot more complex. Uh, we, we mentioned, you, actually your question was uh, what, what uh, uh, startup founders uh, should, should uh, focus on in the future. And uh, you can see that a lot of the hanging fruits were uh, you know, taken many, many uh, moons ago, essentially. And so right. things are getting a lot more uh, you know, uh, technology driven uh, than they were previously um, uh, is one thing. Um, uh, the other is, um, uh, uh, the, the, the actual concept of having people in Shenzhen was for them to learn how to build things from scratch. Uh, and so, you know, essentially you were in the, in the kitchen to learn how to cook. Um, and, but the pandemic has, has, has changed that, of course, uh, because people cannot go to, to China anymore at this moment. Um, and so we had to, uh, uh, you know, put things in the cloud quite a bit. Um, and uh, in the conjunction of that, we, we opened an office in, uh, uh, in New York, actually. Uh, recently as well, and um, uh, th there is a question, uh, I think, around, um, uh, Edwin was, was mentioning earlier, the, uh, those products with, with Indonesia, and, and it makes me think now whether or not, uh, you know, in the past it was all about, you build one thing, it has to be global, uh, you have to be number one, get all the money, and, and that's it. Um, but now we might be looking at, uh, at regions, essentially, where products can live, um, uh, you know, on their own and scale, because the economies and the uh, the ecosystems are, are here and good enough to support uh, the early stage, but also uh, you know up to the IPO. Essentially, uh, is sort of uh, uh, where things might be going. Um, of course, the IPO and the liquidity is a whole different topic. Uh, you know, with uh, Europe and, and Asia at the moment, um, uh, but um, but you can imagine that uh, uh, whatever we have done in China is actually perhaps uh, replicable um, uh, in some ways, which I didn't believe before, actually. In, in uh, Singapore, possible. is it possible? Is it something you've, you have spent time in? We, we looked at it, yeah. Um, at the moment, it's very difficult to find, um, you know, prototypers, essentially, like, you know, small factories that are willing to, you know, uh, put some, you have a design on, on, on Friday night, uh, and you, you send that out, and you're like, you know, can I get it on Sunday morning? Uh, and can you do it for you know uh, $200? Yeah. Uh, that's not possible today anywhere else but uh, China. 
Uh, so yeah, that's that's the the thing. <laughs> yeah. Maybe Singapore plus Batam. Uh, yeah. Yes, that could be one but way. The, that's where also you know like uh, additive manufacturing and subtractive manufacturing, and um, uh, but also I think uh, uh, behind that question is access to prototyping facilities, which exist already uh, over here, and there are uh, I think fantastic uh, facilities at NUS and and, uh, and elsewhere. Mm. Um, um, uh, I think on the biotech side, are, those are quite available. Like you can find wet labs fairly easily. Uh, our companies are have been hosted in, uh, in in many many places around Singapore, and everybody's very happy. Uh, when it comes to hardware, um, uh, there is one issue, um, which is the, uh, the the access to the machine is one thing, but actually, uh, the funders are not here to to do the machining, uh, and so uh, what's what's missing out uh, in most places in the world, and uh, same thing in New York at the moment, is actually people able to operate those machines uh, and, able, and have the experience to help people you know, uh, put things together. Right. Um, and so, uh, so, so the more you know, Singapore creates those talents, essentially, uh, the better. And that's the, the part, right? The talent pool is uh, kind of limited as well in, in Singapore. And um, I mean, in the, in the travels that you have, uh, I mean, all of you have traveled quite a bit. So do you see opportunities for us to uh, bring in more of these kind of people? Is there a way to attract more of these kind of hands-on, you know, more, more uh, you know, uh, comfortable with this kind of makerspace uh, mentality type of people. So I think one of the challenges we see here, and at least in our interactions with many, many uh, companies, is uh, we, we train a lot of these people, but not a lot of them, uh, you know, hang around, right, in this <laughs> industry. So this is something that we, we as a whole, as a collective ecosystem, we're trying to figure out what's, what's, what do we need to do more. Is it because of lack of opportunities or money or what? So, well, I'll try to answer <laughs> that, even though it's a hard I one. But, 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 um, I would say yes. I just got imported from Boston, which is one of the greatest ecosystem in the world for deep tech, and yeah. maybe that's a good thing or a bad thing. You made but, the right choice. But, but, but kidding aside, um, I think there is opportunity to get talent to move here. Um, I think there are mechanisms being put in place. <sighs> this isn't being live broadcast, so I will say, I, I, I think certain leading countries in different parts, very different parts of the world, have, um, have actually made it less attractive for them to, to bring top tier immigrant talent. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, you know, at the end of the day, the country is only so big, but hey, if you're building a, a category-defining company, you're going to become global quickly, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to leverage that. And, and we talk a lot about um, early-stage companies, which are Singapore headquarters, should think about being globally competitive from day one. And not everything has to be built. If you're building a bunch of transforming companies, I mean, they'll have multiple offices all over the world. So um, I, I'm, I'm pretty... Talent is one of the difficult things, right? And, and at Zora, in addition to investing in companies that are already formed, already packaged, and it's great management team, great traction, which is give money and they keep growing, we're helping to assemble companies, right? Whether it's out of some of the great research being done here or pairing research done abroad with research here and, and bringing talent together. And we're already seeing some traction on that front. So I would say, yes, there is opportunity. Mm. Um, but if you want to attract the best talent in the world, you have to create opportunities, be funding opportunities that are globally competitive because they are going to um, be thinking that way. And then I'll, I'll go back to your previous question and I'll answer it in a, in a little different way. But while I'm on my little rant, apologies. But, um, you know, how, how do you make yourself more attractive? You have to think of be, being globally competitive. And, you know, I say, like, pick, pick an area, right? You want to do battery recycling. And you invented something in any number of countries. You've got some traction. The field is so hot, you'll find $5 million from somebody to invest in you, right? But what you should be thinking is, there is a company called Redwood Materials, founded by the ex-CTO of Tesla, right, who was with them all along, who hired all those people, who, you know, like, and, you know, the scale, the speed, the talent, the resources that are brought into that company, you are competing against that company. 
And, um, and I find a lot, you know, I'm Canadian actually. I grew up in Canada and now I'm in Singapore. In the smaller ecosystems, it's very easy to get kind of silo thinking. Mm -hmm. And one of the things you can do to make yourself more attractive is get out, you know, get out in the world, take a trip. It's not that like, again, I'm not American. It's not everything is better <laughs> in America, right? But yes, you do need to go to the valley and see yeah. what the best in class companies look like. Right. Ideally, you find the mentors who really, so you understand what that very top tranche of caliber is, and you try to set yourself on that trajectory. That's, you know, that would be my advice to, to first-time founders, which I've been yeah. one. I know how painful it is. <laughs> yeah. I think there is a bit of, of a conundrum uh, with uh, the fact that the, the, the companies uh, that are born here, um, uh, most of the time, will find their first customer elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, and it happens with our companies in clean tech in particular, happens times and times over again. And, and that, that can be in Canada, that can be in Australia, in the US. Uh, they were all born here, but at some point they have to leave because the market is, is somewhere else. And at that point, uh, generally, you know, they have to start building a new team essentially to uh, you know, polish up the, the product. Yeah. Uh, but then it's very tempting because the CEO has moved there and he's like, oh, well, now I'm, I might have my product development team. And so what's going on in Singapore, uh, you know, it's a sort of a legacy thing. Um, and, um, and so, and, and every VC will tell you that, uh, you know, of course the company has to be where the market is. Um, uh, and so uh, uh, coming back to um, uh, what you're mentioning as well, it's like, it's like the, uh, Singapore has to make the market attractive. Uh, it, it's back to the corporations providing really um, uh, clear uh, strategic uh, directions and, and, com and, and pilots and like, like real money um, uh, that creates from scratch those, um, uh, those, those in new industries essentially in the country um, or else uh, there is a, you know, uh, maybe a, a different model to be thought about what does that mean that for those companies going around and, and uh, the place of Singapore you know, with uh, uh, having birthed uh, those companies, you know, what's, uh, what's the relationship? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's... Uh, uh, Sorry, I, I can't help myself. I'll just jump in really quickly. Like, <laughs> true, right, you expand and you get more presence. And maybe someday you have more headcount mm. in, in another country. But actually, there's the reverse also bringing companies here, right, which I yeah. know you guys are trying to do it. Sure. And I'd say, you know, even when they start here, I wouldn't want the site to be seen as a legacy. It's, you know, I agree with that challenge, but there are assets here that are really unique. Yeah. And... We need to educate the deep tech community on what we have to offer in Singapore. And I'll give one example. I won't name a company, but I was just at IME the other day, right? The clean rooms, right? The facilities, amazing, right? I, I, I was in, you know, I was in the Boston ecosystem. Again, the Harvard and MIT clean rooms, they, they are not comparable to the IME clean rooms, right? So that's a resource to do research here, right? You would want to have a center. You would want to have access to those facilities. I think there's a lot to do here. But does that mean if you're growing a company with 2,000 headcount and five years, you know, 1,800 are here? I mean, not, you know, no. But can we pick the right things to do here? Mm. And then, you know, we, we think a lot about this as a, as a jumping point to Asia. And I mean, the, the trend is, uh, geopolitical trends are such that I think there's great til tailwinds yeah. in Singapore. And, um, and so I just wanted to share my optimism a little bit. <laughs> I, 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 I want to say one thing, though, about talent. While you use the word rant, there's the, the definition of talent is too narrow, I think, the way that we typically look at it. Like clean, clean rooms, tech talent, Singapore is wonderful um, in terms of these kind of things. But the thing that is undervalued here is the guy that you always hire as your second hire in the US, and it's this super connected guy who's excellent at sales, who can go out and he can push the word out and, and bring revenue into your company. And that talent is, is less defined than I'd like it to be in this environment. Because when, when I look for, when I try and get an EP for someone here who's not a tech guy, but is that super connected guy who could be really, really important in, in the growth of my business, um, I don't want him to be asked why he doesn't have a, you know, a tech degree or something in there. I just want people to look at his Rolodex and say, this guy is amazing. He's going to do wonders for this business. So I would like to see within the Singapore context a slight redefinition of talent to include that guy because that's something the Americans are really good at. 
is, is finding that sales guy and finding that super connector that can grow the business. So tech talent's wonderful here, the facilities are great, but just widening the definition of talent to include that guy, I think it'd be do wonders for some of the businesses in this room. Have you thought about can hiring I Edwin? Or, sorry, <laughs> have you thought about hiring Edwin? <laughs> yes, I may do that. <laughs> uh, no, but as the only representative of the government on this panel, I think I have to jump in to clarify that point, John, because uh, actually the, the, the kind of people that you describe, right, uh, would fit into uh, our entrepreneur's category. Right? So if, if you're going to bring him in to found uh, or be the employee number two of a, of a company, then come talk to us and bring him in under an entrepreneur scheme. The, the, the issue with the broader talent management framework, and I don't know if anyone from MOM is here, no, right? Okay, so I can, I'll check. That's good. My EP is probably behalf. safe now for them. <laughs> um, yeah. they, they, they have, a, they have a, an, uh, a metric where they, they want to map the skill sets of the, of the applicant right, to this age profile and the expected salary. So yeah. there is a formula that you can figure out eventually. I mean, some people have written uh, little apps ago and uh, game the system. But actually, it is, it is quite uh, uh, it's, it's easier now to bring in someone like that. The, now, my rant, my little rant, and speaking as a government officer, my rant is that we have abused that word talent, right, in the context of foreign uh, professionals, right, too much, right. Now, a person like what you've described, a tech founder, uh, even an artist or, or, or someone who can create uh, something new, create jobs and create wealth, now, these are the real talent that we're yeah. bringing in. Not your, you know, banker minus one, your accountant, your, I mean, frankly, these people are here to do a job. They are, they are immigrant workforce. We welcome that, right? But we don't go out of our way to then uh, give, uh, give them this halo effect because then everyone else who's not like that, right, is by definition not talent, which I think is, is, is very sad. And I mean, the, 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 the point about the global companies, the conundrum that Cyril brought up is a very real one for us in government because when we use taxpayers' money to uh, fund and grow these early stage startups, at some point in time, we hope that they will succeed and they will then create jobs and wealth and then taxes for the government here. But if most of the value is then captured outside of Singapore, uh, it's a loss to us. But at the same time, we know, right, uh, to, to Phil's point, you want to succeed globally, you have to be global almost from, if not day one, then day two. That means you have to go where the talent pools are. Absolutely, yeah. And I think that's that, that delicate balance that we try and manage and so far, I don't think we have, we have quite got it yet, uh, perfectly right yet. But I think our approach of making Singapore the best place for early stage startups to have product market fit, to have that first customer in Asia, and at the same time, building on certain uh, peaks of excellence that we have, whether it's in semiconductors or biomedical and, and increasingly maybe climate tech, that could then give us that, 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 that sort of uh, happy balance. But it's, uh, it's not something that will be static. It's something that we have to continuously monitor and, and, and track as, as things evolve. Just wanted to get it out there. <laughs> <laughs> We've all done our rants now, so yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm, gonna, I'm gonna just uh, jump in here and um, you know, given the time and all that, uh, but just so uh, any, any last words, one liner from, from all of you before we end the session. My team is... Uh, they're telling us to wrap up. Uh, look, my last line is always the same in, in this context, and that is to founders, uh, if you're pitching us, just be yourself, just be honest. Um, we don't want to know that you've got every problem solved. We just want to know that you're focused on a really nice problem that can potentially scale. As VCs, we don't want to invest in donut shops. We want to invest in stuff that can go to the moon, right? So we, we want stuff that can scale. But just be yourselves, be honest. Tell us what's, what problems you're trying to solve and what you haven't solved yet. We're going to assume you haven't solved everything or else you wouldn't need our money. So that would be my advice. Ditto. <laughs> well, maybe I'll, I'll answer the question, is there light at the end of the tunnel? And I, <laughs> I, I, I think yes, and I'll say specifically, you know, I think it's still very early days for uh, Singapore's deep tech ecosystem. But, you know, all, I mean, not that long ago, New York City didn't even have a real venture ecosystem, right? I actually think great things are coming in the next decade, and um, it's a big challenge to take on, and we all have to work together. But I, I'm, I'm quite optimistic, and I think there's great light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so um, I, I'm new uh, to, to the uh, ecosystem, but um, I actually came over here uh, 10 years ago for the uh, uh, inauguration of Block 71. Um, mm -hmm. and. Uh, and have been exposed, you know, uh, uh, in and out um, with the uh, the ecosystem. 
Um, and uh, when, I, when I looked at it back then, you know, it looked like a, a big experiment and uh, everybody was wondering whether that would work. Um, and, uh, you know, from a, a VC uh, you know, standpoint, uh, looking at um, uh, countries throwing lots of money into uh, uh, VC is always, you know, raising eyebrows, essentially. Um, and uh, it's been done in many other countries, of course, but uh, uh, I'd say that, you know, coming back here, it's quite visible that it actually created very positive effects. Um, and uh, it's probably uh, one of the uh, most, it was most likely the most successful ecosystem, uh, I must say, uh, for, uh, for tech and, and I think to some extent uh, nowadays to, uh, to deep tech as well. Uh, so it's, it's very exciting to be, to be here. Yeah, I think we have all the building blocks but uh, we will still need a bit of work to, to integrate all of them. But thank you very much for all your uh, very delightful uh, insights into this uh, thing. And uh, I guess this is a conversation that we could go on and on. And, but uh, we will have to stop here because uh, the, the, uh, the real feature today is the startups. Um, you know, I want to thank all the panelists, uh, John, Edwin, Phil, and Cyril. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.